Good evening. So good to be here with you all. If you will open with me to the book of Habakkuk, please. The book of Habakkuk. I'm so thankful to be here with you all and to be able to bring my family. It seems like for us, the last four years, uh, when I've been invited to do VBS or summer series, uh, my wife has been pregnant or, or right about to have one of our kids, and so I have had to come to the few of these without them, and I'm so thankful they're able to join me this evening to worship with you all. I've been looking forward to this ever since I was invited, and I hope you'll join with me this evening as we study through the book of Habakkuk. We've been going through the minor prophets in Charlotte, or, or Central, for about the past few months now, just kind of taking it book by book, and, and one of the prophets that have stuck with me has been the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk has a, a work here that is just so very real and so very helpful, especially in modern times, that it just it sticks with me. And I hope that as we go through it tonight, you'll see what I mean by that. If you look at me in the book of Habakkuk, let's start in verse 1 of chapter 1. Habakkuk 1, 1. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Go ahead and clip that out. One of the issues that Habakkuk has, or really what he starts here with, is an issue that I find my kids have sometimes. Now, I may be biased, and I, I know I probably am. My children are pretty good, at least in my eyes here and there. But every now and then, there will come a time when they're sitting at my, on my knee or standing next to me, when they're pulling at my sleeve and, and saying, Dad, 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 and trying to ask me a question or point something out, and I seem to be caught in a conversation or focusing on something else or trying to get some work done. And all they're doing is seemingly getting louder and louder and more animated until finally it seems like I've got a full-blown breakdown on my hands. Now, they're not doing that in my mind to really be rude or hurtful. They're doing that because they feel unhurt. They want dad to listen to them. They want mom to listen to them. And sometimes it just seems as if mom and dad are a little more preoccupied by something else. And so they get loud, they cry, they maybe even throw a tantrum because they want to be heard. And right now in that moment, they feel ignored. And I think we can understand this even as we get older. Now, we may not throw a temper tantrum when we're lying on the floor screaming and crying, but sometimes when we feel unheard and ignored, it comes out in the forms of angry questions. We're frustrated. Maybe we even get a little depressed because it seems like we're the only one who, are, who is caring for something. We start to feel like we're unheard, that we're constantly working up energy to fight against something or to, to prove something or to teach something, and yet no one cares to listen, or no one even wants to pay attention. And think about that when it comes to our faith. Maybe sometimes we grow wary of our walks of faith, and we sit there and we start to cry out to God, God, why aren't you listening to me? Why don't you hear me? Where are you? This way of feeling has never been foreign to those who are striving to obey our Father. Because it is a lifestyle that calls for that kind of uniqueness, that kind of separation from the world. And sometimes when we're faced with this way of feeling, whether within ourselves or others, we just start to respond with kind of simplicities or things that have been rotating in our minds for so long. You know, you just need to pray more. Just read your Bible a little more. You know, just take a break for a second. And please don't misunderstand me. Those things are useful and helpful and are, are important to be reminded of. But sometimes we just revolve around those trite sayings and throw them up and say, well, there's not really that much work that needs to be done. You just aren't praying as much as you should. Do you think that's what Habakkuk was told here in this passage? Because what Habakkuk does in this moment is he's saying to God, God, I am praying so much. God, I am looking for you. I am trying to hear your word and you are not listening. Look back there in verse 2. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? This is the cry of someone who has not just been turning to God in that moment, but someone who's been praying constantly, and he feels unheard. This evening, we're going to look at this person, this, this prophet's struggle with doubt and loneliness. This evening, we're going to look at Habakkuk and understand his question that he starts off right there in the very beginning. How long shall I cry for help? Because sometimes I think we feel that way. Lord, how long shall I cry for help? How long shall I fight against this temptation? How long shall I be beset by this trial that is before me? How long must I suffer before I see your glory, your beauty, and your promised salvation? 
The beauty of Habakkuk's book is not that he leaves us with these cliffhangers, though. You see, he asks these questions, and God answers him. And through that, we are given comfort, we are given strength, and we are given understanding about our, how our life is meant to approach God and deal with God and, and show him our gratitude while still feeling like we can go before him with honesty and f- true, raw emotion. And that's what we're going to see this evening. Habakkuk's work breaks down very simply. There are three prayers of Habakkuk's struggle and praise and two responses of God to his servant's struggle. And we're going to work them together. We're going to tie in the questions that Habakkuk asks and apply them to ourselves and then look and see what God tells us in order to overcome those. So how long shall we cry for help? Well, if you look with me, we're going to start reading back in verse 2. And you'll have to forgive me. We're going to read about six to seven verses here. My math is not very good. It may be a little bit more, but just... Bear with me, and we'll we'll get this whole uh, whole thing going. Starting in verse 2. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Look among the nations and see, wonder, and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all of their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. Habakkuk first asks this question, and, you know, how long shall I cry for help? And in this, he he kind of poses to us or helps us to understand that I will cry out as long as I feel hopeless. When you look at what Habakkuk is saying here, he's saying that he he has lost the, the light at the end of the road. He doesn't see the journey. He doesn't see the destination. He is stuck. To feel hopeless is to feel like there is no no solution. There's nothing going to fix the problem. There's no resolution. There's no answer. I am stuck in this never-ending, revolving cycle of suffering. To feel hopeless is to feel like we are drowning in our struggles, while others are swimming by us with ease. And every time we look around, we just see success. And then we look in our lives, and we feel like it's only failure. To feel hopeless is to feel like we take two steps back anytime we make any sort of progress in our faith, in our gospel, or in our evangelism, in our Bible studies, if we take one step forward. To feel hopeless is to feel like we are working as hard as we can and no one is noticing. And when we feel this way, sometimes the only response, often the only response we have is to cry out for help. I can't find hope, so I need someone else to find that hope for me. I can't see the light, and so I need someone else to shine it upon me. And as we feel more and more alone, more and more ignored, we will continually cry out and loudly until we hope someone sees us. We hope someone hears our plight, and we hope that there is a lifeline there to, get, to gather. Habakkuk feels hopeless. If you look back in verses 2 through 4, you can feel the hopelessness that Habakkuk writes in. You see, Habakkuk does not waste time in his prayer to God. He doesn't sit there and you know, b- try to butter up the Creator, his Father, by saying, Oh, praise you, wonderful things. And please don't misunderstand me. Praising is this wonderful part of prayer. But in this moment, only thing on Habakkuk's mind is sorrow. And he cries out and says, God, I'm crying to you, and you don't respond. How long is this going to go on? How long will I sit there and pray and pray and pray and just hear crickets on the other end? Here is God's prophet crying out for answers from his God, frustrated that he has not received any answers. And he feels like as he looks around him that there's only violence setting in. And salvation, that promised gift from God, is nowhere to be found. And then in verse 3 and 4, he lays out that evidence of what he's seeing. He says, God, you're making your prophet look at sin and wickedness, and I can't do anything against it. You're making your prophet look at the, uh, the, the violence, the struggle, the destruction just continually succeed. 
and the words of righteousness fall on deaf ears. Verse 4, he says, God, your law, your justice, it's, it's paralyzed. Because righteousness is surrounded and being snuffed out. And so when there is good that could grow, it goes away rather quickly. Habakkuk is looking for answers. He's looking for God to respond. And all he finds is wickedness and destruction. He doesn't see God's control anymore. He doesn't see God's power being established. And when Habakkuk is crying out to God here, he feels hopeless that not only is the answer not there in front of him, he's hopeless that God may not answer him. He's hopeless that his prayer might not actually work. He feels completely alone, surrounded only by darkness. When we read Habakkuk's frustrations, I feel like we can each relate to his emotional plea before God. Because sometimes when we look at the world around us and the way that the world is going, it's not that different from biblical times. You see, the sin and the temptation is always the same. The technologies might change. The avenues and the pathways might change. But the sin and temptation that we deal with today is the same sin and temptation that the prophets dealt with. Maybe it's what we see being shared on social media. It's continually and overwhelmingly negative, or maybe even politically charged instead of something that is uh, faith-related. Maybe it's full of false teaching or social pressure to accept sin and support it, and if you don't, you're going to get called out behind keyboard warriors. Maybe it's what we hear in our friend groups. Maybe it's some ideas that have slipped in and become influential in their family and works that have led them away from God. Maybe it's lifestyles that are accepted and supported that are unrighteous and just straight, uh, straight up wicked. Maybe it's what we see in our communities and our rulers. Deception and treachery, ideas and actions of self-righteousness and oppression towards any that aren't on a specific side. And we look around and we say, where's the light? Where's the good? And so we try to turn to God. And maybe then it's what we don't see or hear. Maybe we pray to God fervently and it's quiet. Maybe we seek his wisdom and his truth and we feel like he's unresponsive or unbothered by the ways that become mainstays in the world that we live in. Maybe we just feel like the answers that were once there for us are no longer there to help us anymore. When we begin to feel this hopelessness of Habakkuk, we become jaded. We start to think nothing's going to change or get better. I must steal myself off to avoid feeling hurt or damaged. I'm not going to put myself out there. I'm not going to work that hard for the gospel. I'm just going to work on myself and on my family and keep us secluded from the world. When we begin to feel this hopelessness of Habakkuk, we don't seek answers to our doubts anymore. We just rather push them to the side or try to try to hide them, but they continually grow louder. And we start to allow the worries and concerns to outweigh the evidence for faith and the trust that God has established before us. And then our frustrations begin to be vocalized. And they can be infectious with others. Maybe it starts to sow seeds of doubt in brethren that weren't there before. Maybe it starts to, to gather this kind of uh, mob, almost. That just is this sounding board of negativity and, and frustration and anger. That there's never a positive thought, but only woe is me. This isn't working. This isn't fair. Habakkuk is hopeless, and he cries out. When we are hopeless, we cry out. And then in verse 5, God responds. And it's a powerful response. If you look back with me in verse 5, this is immediately what God says. Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. You see, when God responds, it's simple to God. Trust in me. And when God responds here, it's firm and strong and powerful, but also it has this kind of calm authority that is meant to comfort his prophet. In verse 5, God tells his prophet just to look around and see, to just open your eyes, or maybe even just take a breath for a moment, Habakkuk, and see what's happening. Because when Habakkuk does this, God is assured he will be filled, that is, Habakkuk will be filled with wonder and amazement at the plan that is unfolding before him. He will see the work of God that is unbelievable to man, but is completely plausible and doable for Yahweh. And then in verse 6 through 11, if just opening his eyes isn't enough, he tells Habakkuk exactly how it's going to go down. The Chaldeans are being raised. The the Babylonians are being raised to punish Israel. He's He's showing Habakkuk very clearly that he is going to deal with this. His justice, his salvation, his power and authority will remain in control and nothing that Israel does in that moment, either wicked or just sinful, 
will stop the punishment to come. You see, God is explaining very clearly to Habakkuk and to Israel and to us. He is in control and he responds to sin. And yet even with this power that exudes itself from the text, there is that calm authority. He's not worried about Israel. He's not worried about Babylon getting out of control. He's not worried about his Habakkuk, his prophet spiraling. He's saying, trust in me. You're in my hands. God responds with his calm authority because he sees all, knows all, and controls all. He is not worried about sin going unpunished because his plan will be completed on his time. God responds with this calm authority because his people will allow anxieties and stress to fall over them and encompass them. And sometimes they just need to hear that soothing voice, that strong voice to pull them up and remind them who they stand upon and who they serve. And for us, this looks different in a number of ways. Maybe it's a disciple that sees us struggling and comes over to us and puts their arm around our shoulder and prays with us and says, I see you. I understand what you're going through. Let's go to God in prayer. Or maybe it's a disciple who who hears our cries, our negativity, and they sit down with us with the Bible and they study with us. And maybe there's no clear-cut answer, but maybe that with a brother or sister who is there to encourage us in our study is enough to help us feel the comfort that we are not alone. You see, when we hear God's calm authority to Habakkuk, and when we start to open our eyes to see how it revolves around or works in our life, we are strengthened. Because we're reminded that he is working. Too often, I think we get stuck in a bubble. We start to think, oh, oh, you know, Zach is doing this and it's not turning out exactly as Zach wants. Oh, you know, Zach is trying his hardest in this area or in this, this avenue and it's just not coming up with any answers. So it must all be failing. Sometimes we need that person to come to us and say, wait, look at what brother so-and-so is doing over here and the wonderful blessings that's bestowing. Look at how sister so-and-so is impacting this part of the community and the example she is portraying to others. What a wonderful blessing that is. When we start to take a step back and to remove ourselves from some of the stress and some of the anxiety, we can see God's plan being carried out. And we can feel His hands in everything. And we can see the strength that our faith is founded upon. And when we hear God's calm authority to Habakkuk and to us, It strengthens us because it's the soothing voice of a father to a child. He's holding our hand. He's carrying us to safety. He is with his people, and he is working for salvation. I will cry out because I cannot find hope, and God will respond with calming authority. Now, if you look at me at the end of chapter, or basically the end of chapter 1, and we're going to go into the first verse of chapter 2. Habakkuk doesn't just sit there and say, okay, thank you, God, for that answer. I'm going to be done now. No, he goes from, God, you are not answering me. Now that you've answered me, God, I've got another issue. If you look there in verse 12 of chapter 1, it says this. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as judgment, and you, O rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offering to his dragnet, for by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich." Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing the nations forever? I will take my stand on my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Habakkuk moves from this idea of, well, I felt hopeless. Now he moves to this idea, this understanding that simply says, I will cry out as long as I perceive injustice. To perceive injustice is to look at a picture and see that it is not exactly as it should be and to feel wronged. This piece of the puzzle needs to be here. This picture needs to be clear. This person needs to be there. To perceive injustice is to feel like the status of the world is upside down. Right is seen as wrong. Wrong is seen as right, and it just doesn't make sense. And really, this all boils down to viewing things through God's foundation of truth. 
It's understanding how God has designed the world and his people and how he has promised his blessings and care for those who obey and trust him. And then feeling like that understanding, like that promise is not being held up. It's not being kept and there's no answer. We cry out when we perceive injustice because it makes everything seem unfair. One of my favorite quotations comes from the movie The Lion King. And it's one that's just, it stuck with me as a kid because my mom used to recite it to me all the time. And it's when Scar, when he's hearing the whining of Simba, looks at him and says, life's not fair. And you know, as a kid, when your mom would say that, it'd be because you, you'd want a candy bar or you'd want to go hang out with your friends and you just can't. You say, well, that's not fair. And, and well, life isn't fair. Sometimes we look out and we say, well, I'm living faithfully. I'm living righteously. And yet I'm not being blessed as I think I should. I'm living faithfully and I look around and I see evil and I see evil succeeding and it isn't fair because my righteousness, my faithfulness is going unanswered. Why is that fair? Why is that good? Why is that okay? And we start to go down this road of why, 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 or why not me, or how can't it be like this? And we miss the picture of what God is trying to do. That's what happens when we perceive injustice. You see, in verses 12 through verse 1 of chapter 2, Habakkuk returns to God in prayer with this different frustration. Why is God using the Babylonians, the wicked, the vile Babylonians, to punish his holy people? It doesn't make sense. In fact, in verse 12 through 13, Habakkuk establishes this understanding of God's character and wisdom. God is eternal, and he has made a promise to his people for them to be eternal. So why then is this going to happen? You see, Habakkuk is no fool. He understands the promises. He understands the work of God to an extent at this moment. But he doesn't quite understand why it's working this way. Why the Babylonians? And in verse 14 through 17, Habakkuk differentiates between God's people and the tool of judgment. The tool drags up mankind like a fisherman with a fish, rejoicing in his catch. And instead of praising God for that catch, for praising God for success, he turns to his fish hook and his net and he says thank you for what you've done he's idolatrous he's wicked and yet he will continue to keep winning it just doesn't make sense to Habakkuk and so Habakkuk makes a promise there in verse 1 he promises that he will stand watch before his people he will listen for God's answer to hear it and then to argue against it to offer another complaint to God if it's not to his liking You see, I think Habakkuk is bordering on the the balance right here where he's almost blaming God for what he's about to do. God, you can't use this wicked nation to punish us. It's just not fair. God, you can't use the Babylonians to punish the Israelites. Yes, the Israelites might be sinful, but we're nowhere near as bad as the Babylonians. Sometimes I feel we get that way. We start to almost blame God for what's going on in the world around us, for the negative uh, attitudes, for the, the wickedness that seems to succeed we start to look at God and say, well, God, it's your fault. Maybe we look around us and we see pride and arrogance being glorified. Maybe we see lust and adultery being supported. Maybe we see greed and a lack of self-control being blessed through their works. And maybe we see all this and we say, wait, doesn't God talk against that? Doesn't God command us that all of those things are sinful and wrong and we should not be like that? So why are they succeeding in his creation? Or maybe it's a different kind of injustice we perceive. Maybe we look at our service to God and we say, you know, God, I, I've taught a Bible class on Wednesday and Sunday night or Wednesday morning and Wednesday night and Sunday morning for the past few years. And no one seems to recognize me or, or thank me for it. You know what, God, I've held a Bible study on a certain weekday every single week for the past few years. And no one seems to praise me for it. You know what, God, I've done this for your kingdom and this for your kingdom. And there's no fruits for my labor. Where's my praise? Where's my reward? And we start to look at that and we say, well, God, I'm being ignored. I I don't think this is fair, so maybe I'll just stop. Maybe I won't do what you want me to do anymore. And maybe we and we begin to blame God for this. We start to say, well, God, if you're in control and you've promised blessings for righteousness and judgment for sinfulness, then why isn't that the case right now? Maybe it's because you don't care. Maybe it's because you're not watching. Maybe it's because you are ignoring it and you just want us to all unravel and unwind and go crazy in this creation. You see, when we begin to allow these questions, this this blame to surround us and permeate our faith, our faith begins to feel like it's not worth the cost anymore. There's no value in it. Because if I'm not being rewarded as I think is best, then I better just go live like the world and see the blessings that they are getting. 
And when we do this, we start to confuse our idea of who God should be with the actual truth of who God is. Because we start to say, God, you have to fit into this box of what I think you should be and how I think you should act and when I think you should act instead of seeing how God acts and what he does and when he acts and saying, God, I trust in what you're doing. And thankfully to Habakkuk, God responds. If you look back with me in verse 2, God responds. It's the entirety of the rest of this chapter, so we won't read all of it, but I do want to read some of it. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he never has enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects his own, all peoples. God hears the complaint of Habakkuk and he comforts him with some assurances. In verse 2 and 3, God calls on Habakkuk to immediately take this vision that he's about to receive and write it down. So that others will hear it, take it, and then run with it to go tell the next person. In verse 4 through 5, God reassures his justice. He tells Habakkuk, pride will lead to betrayal and death. Faithfulness will lead to life. He says, the truth that God's message and God's law that has the truth that God's message and law has been founded upon will not change. It just may not happen the way you, Habakkuk, want it to. And then in verse 6 through 20, God will pronounce five woes upon the Chaldeans. They will receive the proper reward for their actions because they were faulty debtors. And so they're going to be plundered for their own plundering. They were oppressive, and so they will now forfeit their own lives. They were violent persecutors, and they will lose their glory to God's strength. They were intoxicating others for their shame, and so now they will be shamed and naked before the world. They were idolatrous and will finally be silent before the true power of the world. And we see all of this come to pass in the book of Daniel. Once Bel, uh, Belshazzar is there drinking wine from the temple goblets or the temple uh, uh, vessels, and God comes in and punishes him by using the Medo-Persians. God's words here are all about assurance. He is in control. The Babylonians will be judged for their sins, and he will still restore his people after they have been punished. And so when he assures Habakkuk, he is showing him that his power and his authority are over all the creation and over all the created people. When he is assuring Habakkuk, he is telling him that his promised word will never go wrong or be misapplied. It will just happen in God's timing. And his assurance is told to Habakkuk that his holiness, God's holiness, will bring all silent before him. When we think on these sayings, it's meant to do the same thing for us. Because instead of thinking of God's work trying to fit into our mindset or our pattern or our timeline, we're reminded that sometimes God is patient, God is long-suffering, and God is compassionate. And just because I want punishment now doesn't mean that's God's plan, because in fact, God may be working on someone in that moment to bring them to salvation. And his assurance to tell me that he is in control is meant to remind me that I am not. And thank goodness for that. You see, when we are reminded of God's justice through his works, we are assured that faithfulness and righteousness will be established and wickedness judged, even if it does take longer than we would like. Because God has made a covenant to us through his son. His son died upon a cross so that sin would be judged, yes, but so that he first and foremost, would come to save the lost. When we're reminded of God's justice through his works, we are assured of that ultimate plan of salvation. Jesus came to this earth to save. And because of that, there's going to be patience, even when we might, not, we might feel like there should be immediate judgment. So I will cry out when I perceive injustice, and God will show me his justice reigning. And finally, if you look at me in chapter 3, at the very end of chapter 3, starting in verse 16, Chapter 3 is is Habakkuk's final prayer. And instead of a complaint, instead of an argument like he said he would give at the beginning of chapter 2, it is all about praise. In verse 16, this is what Habakkuk says. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will wait quietly for the day of trouble 
to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. The final way that Habakkuk cries out is just exceedingly simple, yet wonderfully profound. I will cry out with complete faith in you. Because Habakkuk has worked through his doubts. Habakkuk has worked through his questions, and he's examined the evidence that God has given him, and he cries out again because he can't hold in his joy any longer. He can't hold in his faith, his hope anymore. To have complete faith in God is to know that no matter what happens in this life, he will take care of his people. Because serving God is not about material blessings, but about the spiritual and eternal security and comfort that he has established with us. To have complete faith in God that makes us cry out is to understand all we can of God, his previous works, his current covenant relationship with us, and his plans for all people. And to have complete faith in God that makes us cry out is just to rejoice with him in his glory and his fulfillment. When Habakkuk reaches his final prayer in chapter 3, he has been comforted and assured by God's answers and providence. And now he works through that understanding, that recognition of the answer and trust to come to this moving and powerful conclusion. In verse 2 of chapter 3, Habakkuk says he knows his father and he knows the work that he has done. And so he asks for God to revive his work in those days and make it known to the world. He says, God, I know you. Help the world know you too. In verse 3, all the way through uh, 15, God, Habakkuk will go through the history of God. From, Exodus to, or from the Exodus to the Canaanite conquest, concerning God's dealing with the Canaanite idols, specifically in verse 8, and his control over the elements, the storms, the trials that the Israelites faced in those times. And Habakkuk contrasts Israel in verse 13. God will save his people, and he will crush the enemy, much the shock and sorrow of Babylon. And then as we just read in verse 16 through 19, Habakkuk powerfully concludes that he will find joy in God always, even if God's provision is cut off from him. Even if there's no stock in his his fields, no uh, cattle in his his, uh, storehouses, he will rejoice in God because God saves him. After a series of heavy prayers and questions with God, this is the complete faith that we are meant to have. It's about using what we have been given and taught to trust in what we do not see or understand completely to understand our God in a better light. So we need to learn how to, I'm going to say, manufacture manufacture this faith, even though it's not like an assembly line where we get one piece at a time, we screw it on and tighten it up. But it's the idea of growing it, of, of maturing in this faith. We do this, we manufacture this through continual study. And I know this is going to sound trite, but please forgive me. Read the Bible and read it again. And not only do you want to read it just for the, the verses and the, the passages to say, oh, well, I, I've read this. I can read the, I've read the Bible cover to cover. Dwell on it. Sit with a verse or two so that it, it means more than just words on a page. Internalize it. Complement it then with sound commentaries to then better open your eyes and our eyes to insights of things we don't know. I am astounded, maybe I shouldn't be astounded, but I am astounded when I I read through commentaries just at the depth of knowledge that there is there that I've barely scratched the surface of. There's always something new. There's always something encouraging or, or enlightening that someone else has seen that is an aid to my walk. We grow this faith, this kind of complete faith, through a continual desire to learn about our God through what He has done. But we also grow this faith through our trials, Because sometimes the struggles of life that we face are not always a response to our actions. It's not always a consequence, but sometimes it's just the fact that we live in a world that is destined to be destroyed. We live in a world that is not our eternal home. Think of Job. Job's uh, problems, Job's trials are not a result of, of his wickedness. They're not a result of unrighteousness. They're a result of Satan looking around for someone to tempt and saying, well, here's this one. And yet what Job does in that book is a wonderful journey of faith where he continually looks to God. And he does have some moments there where there's some pride and some arrogance that need to be dealt with by God in the end. But at the end of it, his faith is still there. That says, God, I I trust in you. Sometimes in our life, the peaks and the valleys we go through are just about life itself. 
And when we go through them and we focus on our faith, it builds up our discipline and our character because we look for God's hand in our lives in all those moments. Whether it's a severe depression or a struggle with something that makes us question why we're doing something or how hard we're working. Or whether it's something that is so joyful we've had a wonderful amount of success with some kind of work or or some kind of evangelism. It's all about seeing God in our lowest and our highest moments and praising Him or seeking Him in those times. But sometimes it's as simple as what God says in verse, uh, in verse 5 of chapter 1. Look around and see. Open your eyes. Open your eyes to His creation. Open your eyes to His wonder, His plan. Open your eyes to the disciples and, and, and servants of His kingdom that are continually working and being blessed in their work. And rejoice in the kingdom that is growing. And when we have questions, ask them. When we have doubts, seek for answers. And maybe you won't always get solid answers, but you will always get a better understanding of our God, a better understanding of how He works, the context of your situation, and God's power and authority that is meant to be this calming situation, this calming comfort to us. And ultimately, we'll get to this faith that Habakkuk ends with. When we are blessed, we will glorify and praise God. When we are struggling, We will seek His will and find strength in Him and His people. When we are happy and content, we are going to be grateful for the peace given to me and seek God's favor all the more. And when we are discouraged, we will ask for help. We will look for guidance through His Word and His people. And when we find that guidance, we will sing out. Because after all of our questions, after all of our doubts and concerns, we will cry out to God with complete faith in Him and His works. Habakkuk is this beautiful work of of real-life faith. And oftentimes it's easy to look at the prophet and say, well, they were special, they were divine, they had, they had some kind of godly authority with them. With Habakkuk, you just see a person who is struggling, just like you and just like me. We go through ups and downs and we find questions and doubts as we study the word. And when we come to Habakkuk, we are shown how to work through those piece by piece and come to the end with this calming understanding of our God and our Savior. Will you pray with me about that? Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before your throne at this time. So thankful for your mercy and your plan of salvation. Father, you know best. Your creation is in the palm of your hand. And we pray, dear Lord, that as we go through this life, striving to live for you, to be your example to those around us, that we are reminded of your authority, of your control. That as much as we might want things to go our way, or in the ways that we think are best, you truly do know best. Give us the comfort the strength, the assurance that you have promised us so that we can continue your work in this world. We pray all this through your Son. Amen. We have the opportunity now to obey the gospel. And I think if if Habakkuk had an extra chapter there, you know, he'd probably add on what that plan of salvation looked like. But of course, he's in the Old Testament, so he's a little before that time. But Jesus came to this earth to die upon the cross for us. For us while we were still sinners, while we were lost, so that we could be with his Father and him in heaven for all eternity. And the way he has done that, he has done all the heavy lifting, all the hard work. And all he asks of us is to respond with faith. We have the opportunity to do so this evening. If there's anyone here with that need of the need of the prayers of this congregation, why don't you come now while we stand and while we sing.